all of humanity you can be divided into group A, B, and C. Group A is made up of those people who live principally off stock dividends, interest payments on their bond investments, royalties on their land and mineral holdings, rents on their properties. That's group A. Group B and C make up the other 99.5% of humanity and they live off group B, people in group B live off wages, salaries, fees, commissions, tips, pensions. And group C is made up of tens of millions of people who don't even get that. They live in utter destitution from hand to mouth, from whatever handouts or whatever charity bits or whatever fragmentary incomes they can scrounge. Um, the thing that the people in group A and B have in common is that they both live off the labor of the people in group B. The people in group A don't just do this, they're very active. They have an active element. We could call them the owning class because they own almost everything in the world. They own most of the land. They own the the factories, the industries, the banks, the media. They also own a lot of the state. That is, their representatives, the politically active elements from their ranks, move in and become the secretaries of defense, secretaries of state, CIA directors. Um, and they're the ones who also filter out in the beginning uh, with, the, with the very first primary, the primary before the one you get to vote in is called the money primary. And they, with their contributions, they filter out who will be the suitable candidates and who will be the unknowns. Uh, and who will be designated at the very beginning the front runners. Now, they take great pains at trying to keep the world this way because they love it that way. I know in the movies you see things about the unhappy rich. Don't, don't believe it for a minute. <laughs> they, love, they love having their private planes and their estates and all their wonderful things and their power and their prestige and their immense wealth. And most of all, they're very concerned about those instruments of organization which accumulate that wealth for them, which are called the giant multinational corporations. Corporations are called producer interests. In fact, they don't produce anything. You tell me what a corporation produces. You tell me what a CEO has ever produced. They are, in fact, organizations for the extraction of surplus value from the workforce. They're organizations that uh, uh, to mobilize economic and political power to make the world safe for Group A. They don't do that. They don't do that directly in many cases, but they pick the people, they pay the lobbyists, they pay the campaign fees, they do all that stuff. And the state then comes in, that component of the state, not the entire government, but that special component of the state known as the national security state, which is made up of the White House, the Defense Department, the State Department, the CIA, military intelligence, the Joint Chief of Staff, FBI, and a few other elements here or there. That national security state, its function is to make the world safe for the Fortune 500 and for the people in Group A. And the history, and this is why the history of U.S. foreign policy, especially after World War II, is a history of bloody repressive interventions on behalf of the people of Group A. U.S. leaders profess a dedication to democracy, yet over the last 50 years, U.S. national security state, the U.S. National Security State has been a key force in overthrowing reformist democratic governments in Guatemala, Guyana, Dominican Republic, Brazil, Chile under Allende, Iran under Mossadegh, Uruguay, Syria, Indonesia under Sukarno, Greece, twice in Greece, Argentina, twice, Haiti, Bolivia, and other countries. These lists, I'm going to give you some lists, they are far from complete. And they replaced them with pro-capitalist military regimes that opened up their markets, opened up their resources, opened up the labor markets to them, and said, come on in, boys, here it is, it's all yours. And if our workers get out of line, if they start organizing and all, we can beat them down. 
We have death squads trained, equipped, paid for. We have a Guardia Civile uh, mili and military trained, equipped for, uh, advised by your people. All you do is take care of me, my brother Jose, my family, a few other people, and the little five or six families that own most of the land, and we'll take care of everything else for you. There's no occupational safety to worry about. There's no minimum wage to worry about. There's no, there's no environmental protections to worry about. There's no labor collective bargaining protections to worry about. There's no consumer protections. There's no child labor laws. You just come on in here. It's the free market in the free world. And that's what we're all about. And you tell your people, too, at home, that you're defending democracy, that you're, having, you're, you're bringing elections to this country and the, and the like. But you don't talk about this part of it. The U.S. has also been active in covert actions or proxy mercenary wars against popular revolutionary governments in Cuba, Angola, Mozambique, Ethiopia, Portugal, South Yemen, Nicaragua, Cambodia, East Timor, Western Sahara, and elsewhere. They've been active in forcibly overthrowing reformist governments in Egypt, Lebanon, Peru, Iran, Syria, Zaire, Jamaica, the Fiji Islands, Afghanistan, before the Soviets ever went into Afghanistan, the CIA was in there through the Pakistanis, ready to destabilize the country. Since World War II, U.S. direct military invasions, now not proxy wars, not subversion, not CIA destabilization and terror and death squads, but direct military invasion with U.S. forces since World War II, or aerial attacks by U.S. forces in Vietnam, Dominican Republic, North Korea, Laos, Cambodia, Lebanon, Libya, Grenada, Panama, Iraq, Somalia, and now Yugoslavia. When you ask, why, are, why is U.S. in Yugoslavia? Why not? They're everywhere else. It's an empire, my friends. It's an empire. And the empire extracts the resources of the republic in order to maintain its imperialist network. It's an empire with 300 major military bases and 2,000 minor bases all over the world. That's a matter of public record. I'm not just arguing that point. It's a matter of public record. Not that it's much taught and rarely ever mentioned in the mainstream media. Now, why has a professedly peace-loving democratic nation found it necessary to use so much violence and repression against so many peoples in so many places? An important goal, as I say, is to make the world safe for the Fortune 500. Governments that strive for any kind of economic independence governments that support any kind of populist redistributive politics which is extracting, say, as Allende did in Chile. In the three years he was in office, um, he took a portion of the gross national income, maybe about five or six or seven percent, shifted from the people in Group A, the people who lived off their investments, to the people who lived off their labor. And that was what was wrong with Allende. When you come in and you start taking and tampering with my wealth, I will kill you. And that's what they did to to Allende. Such governments are the ones most likely to feel the wrath of U.S. intervention or invasion. The designated enemy can be a reformist, populist military government as in Panama under Torillo and even under Noriega, Egypt under President Nasser, Peru under Velasco, Velasco, Portugal after Salazar when the generals came in. It could be a Christian socialist government as in Nicaragua under the Sandinistas. It could be a social democracy popular front as in Chile under Allende or in Jamaica under Michael Manley or in Greece under Papandreou in 1965 or the Dominican Republic under Juan Bosch. Or it could be a Marxist-Leninist government as in Cuba Vietnam, North Korea. It could be an Islamic revolutionary order as in Libya under Gaddafi, or even a conservative militarist regime as in Iraq under Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein was CIA. He was put in by the CIA and his job was to stop 
and put a break on the Iraqi revolution. And he was our boy. He was, the, he was the White House's boy for a long time. But then he started doing some funny things like free medical care, education. Iraq had one of the better standards of living in the entire Middle East. And then he started doing something that was totally unacceptable, trying to fight for a better deal on the oil prices against the uh, Seven Sister oil cartels. And that's when, of course, he had to be done in. The U.S. is also the most active promoter or protector of drug traffickers who serve the gangster functions of U.S. policy, which is terror, assassination, intimidation. Late 1940s, Corsica and Sicilian drug mafia, communist longshore unions, which were honest and militant and dedicated and political, were smashed. By, the, by these gangsters and terrorists with the help and aid by the CIA and the payback, the payback that the CIA gave to these gangsters was a free hand in the drug trades. In Southeast Asia, the drug lords, active collaboration, the Golden Triangle, Air America was the airline that shipped the, her the heroin out of there. Air America, it turned out, was owned by the CIA. And do you know what the first market was for the Golden Triangle? Where was it? Soldiers. That's right. The soldiers in Vietnam, a perfect market. Nearby, 100,000 young men with nothing to do, homesick, with good money, as compared to other, most of the world, spending money, nothing to do, and all of them, or so many of them, come back with a drug problem. That drug problem didn't just happen. The Vietnam GIs just didn't suddenly just go berserk. It's because that, that the drugs were there, they were cheap, they were plentiful, they were pouring in. Supply creates demand. We always think of demand creating supply, but in many instances, it's supply that creates demand. In Afghanistan, the Mujahideen who fought against the Soviets were drug dealers. I remember seeing it prominently displayed in the Washington Post on page 22 to 35th paragraph. With the Mujahideen back in power, um, uh, the heroin supplies, much of which reaches uh, uh, the um, American streets, will now increase in abundance. I said, isn't this amazing? I think it's like it was a weather report. There was this one sentence in the middle. I said, now can you imagine if that was Fidel Castro? or the Sandinistas or somebody, why they'd still be talking about it on the evening news three years later, re referencing it. And they were CIA supported. And now we have the Kosovo Albanians. Let me quote the San Francisco Chronicle, 5 May 99. Kosovo Albanians, including the KLA, hold the largest share of the heroin market in Switzerland, Austria, Belgium, Germany, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Norway, and Sweden. The eminent political scientist Jim Petrus told me just the other day that the KLA leader owns the biggest whorehouse in Europe. It's in Macedonia. The poverty, the poverty that we see throughout the third world, those people struggling in group B, many of them falling into group C, the hundreds of millions of them, that poverty is not an original historical condition. It was imposed by colonizing forces. Walter Rodney, who was assassinated, Walter Rodney wrote an interesting book called How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And I, and I always thought the title, the use of the word underdeveloped as a verb was very important and very revealing. That it was something that was done to Africa. Africa wasn't underdeveloped. There were rich cultures there. Africa is a rich continent. Latin America is a rich continent. Asia is a rich continent. The imperialists, the colonialists, don't go to poor places. They go to rich places. They go in there to take their markets, to take their oil, their timber, their cotton, their hemp, their flax, their, their um, gold, their silver, their diamonds, and a thousand other things. And they go in there to exploit and ruthlessly exploit their labor. That's why you go, Africa is rich. Only its people are poor. And there's still problems in Africa today. There's still outrageous things going on in Africa. Building their own pharmaceutical factories in the Sudan. Where do you get off thinking you can do that when you should be buying pharmaceuticals from the multinational pharmaceuticals? Owning your own land. A lot of the land in Africa is still in the village economy. 
collectively run, often by the way run and worked by women in collectives. They got no business all running that land. That's our land. That's our land that belongs to us. The agribusiness multinationals will get that land. That's what Clinton was doing in Africa last year. He was letting them know there's going to be a gap for Africa. A gap. When I was a kid in the old gangster movies, a gap was a gun you held to somebody's head. Indeed. getting worked up here. <laughs> so the goal is to deracinate the population. That is, get them off the land, de-skill them, and then f make them, force them to work at subsistence wages. Take the case of India. India was a rich, advanced, developed country until the British went in, in 1800. And between 1800 and 1830, the Indian textile industry, which was outperforming the British textile industry in exports and quality, was dismantled. And between 1840, and the whole, the, whole, the whole balance of trade was shifted. The great textile centers of Dhaka and Madras were de-industrialized, and the people were sent back out on the land to grow cotton for the factories in Manchester and London. And between 1850 and 1900, the Indian per capita income fell by 65%. So that poverty in the third world, that so-called underdevelopment, these so-called developing nations that are now beginning, like little children learning how to walk, and we will help them along. These countries are not underdeveloped. They were overexploited. They're maldeveloped. <clears throat> and it's not racism that sends the white colonizers off into into these, into Latin America, Africa, and Asia. They don't care what color you are. Imperialism is an equal opportunity exploiter. The first, the first imperialism, the first imperialism was by Western Europe against Eastern Europe, against the Slavs, back in the 15 and 1600s. They were whites. The oldest imperialism of the British colony is against Ireland. Ireland. Frederick Engels, traveling through Ireland in 1856. How often have the Irish started out to achieve something, and every time they have been crushed politically and industrially. By consistent oppression, they have been artificially converted into an utterly impoverished nation. There's the key words, artificially converted into an impoverished nation. Of course, when you start finding out that so many of the people that you are oppressing and killing are colored, that comes in handy, you see. You can start saying things like, well, they're moral inferiors. These darker races are savages and such. After you go in and you burn their, you burn their townships and their homes and, and, and destroy their, their, their smelting, th uh, you know, construction, their industry, they have some industry, mining even, and whatever else, you, you kill their men or enslave them uh, uh, in your, for your work in your industry, you do all this kind of stuff, you have to justify that and you say, this is the white man's burden, we're here to try to help these people, to uplift them, you see. Always beware of the people who are ready to uplift you. Uh, <laughs> And so that's what, and racism, in short order, racism becomes a very useful thing to cloak and justify class exploitation. <clears throat> now, why, why is the U.S. national security state involved in acts of destabilization, sabotage, propaganda, terror, drug trafficking, torture and death squads in Latin America, Asia, Africa and Europe. Why, why is it now, is it now suddenly so impelled by humanitarian concerns for the Albanians in Kosovo? Is that why we're in Yugoslavia? 
Is it humanitarian compassion that compels U.S. forces to be bombing, to have bombed four countries in the last six months? Is it humanitarian concern that the U.S. is involved in proxy wars in Angola, Colombia, and various other countries? If it's oppressed minorities U.S. leaders are worried about, why doesn't Clinton bomb the Turkish people for what their leaders have been doing to the Kurds? Why doesn't he... I mean, it would be crazy and irrational to bomb people in Turkey, to bomb the ordinary people because of what they're doing. But that, that's what we're doing. That's what the, is happening in Yugoslavia. Why don't we bomb the Indonesians for killing over 200... because their generals killed over 200,000 East Timorese? What about bombing Israel for what it's done to the Palestinians? What about bombing the Czech Republic for the way it has mistreated the Romani, or called gypsies here uh, in, in, our, in our country? What about bombing the Guatemalan people? Bomb, let's go bomb Guatemala City for the systematic slaughter of tens of thousands of Mayan villagers all over Guatemala. In fact, the U.S. wouldn't dare ever think of bombing them. The U.S., in most of those cases, Turkey, Indonesia, Guatemala, gave them aid, gave them guns, gave them training. It's totally complicit with those horrible atrocities. Why doesn't, why doesn't he bomb Great Britain for oppressing the Catholic minority in Northern Ireland? Go, go bomb his girlfriend, Tony Blair. <laughs> T Tony, Tony Blair is Bill Clinton in drag. Look, look, look closely at him. Why doesn't he bomb the Hutu for the mass murder of a half a million Tutsis in Rwanda and bomb the French imperialist force that went in and was totally complicit in that massacre? In fact, Bill Clinton didn't even want to discuss it. He didn't even want to apply the name genocide to that. He didn't want to get into it because he liked the stopping of the Tutsi Liberation Army. They had a scent of column B about them. And while Clinton is at it, why doesn't he bomb himself for the treatment of Native American Indians, African Americans, and working people in general? In 1919, 1919, a noted conservative economist, Joseph Schumpeter, whose work I've read extensively, incidentally, Schumpeter wrote this about ancient Rome. Excuse me. That policy which pretends to aspire to peace but unerringly generates war, the policy of continual preparation for war, the policy of meddlesome interventionism, there was no corner of the known world where some interest was not alleged to be in danger or under actual attack. If the interests were not Roman, they were those of Rome's allies. And if Rome had no allies, then allies would be invented. When it was utterly impossible to contrive such an interest, why then it was the national honor that had been insulted. The fight was always invested with an aura of legality. Rome was always being attacked by evil-minded neighbors, always fighting for a breathing space. The whole world was pervaded by a host of enemies, and it was manifestly Rome's duty to guard against their indubitably aggressive designs. They were enemies who only waited to fall on the Roman people. Does that sound familiar to you at all? We hear today that we don't have one enemy. We have many now. The world communism has been defeated, but now we have many different enemies. They're all around, ready to pounce on us. And unless we keep those extortionary military budgets going, unless we keep being everywhere, all the place, our people will not be safe. They're out there ready to pounce upon us. Why aren't they ready to pounce upon Denmark, say. I mean, why, doesn't, why doesn't Denmark have a world empire? What about little, weak, helpless, sweet Luxembourg? Wouldn't they want to pounce on Luxembourg? Why would they want to pounce on us? Well, I maintain that that's just, that's just the mass line to cover the class line. I gave you what the class line was a little while ago. 
Yugoslavia, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, was built on an idea, as Ramsey Clark said. Very few countries are actually built on an idea. The idea was that the southern Slavs would not remain weak, divided people falling out among themselves or falling prey to some imperialist outsider. That they would join together and they would have a territory that was large enough and strong enough to become a viable nation with its own development. And sure enough, after World War II, multi-ethnic socialist Yugoslavia was a post-war industrial power, a viable nation, and an economic success. Between 1960 and 1980, it had one of the most vigorous growth rates, a decent standard of living, free medical care and education, guaranteed right to a job, one month free vacation with pay. Oh, when was the last time I had a month vacation? Oh, I can't remember. Affordable public transportation, housing, and utilities. Literacy rate over 90%. Life expectancy was 72 years. Most of the economy was in the public, not-for-profit sector. Now, such a country is a kind that global capitalism normally would not tolerate. Still, Yugoslavia was allowed to exist for some 45 years because it was seen as a buffer to the Soviet bloc, the Warsaw Pact nations. At the same time, efforts were made to undermine the socialistic features of Yugoslavia's economy. Yugoslavia opened itself up, up to Western capital penetration as early as the late 60s, early 70s, I, I think it was. I think they made the same mistake that the Polish Communist Party leaders made. They said, well, what we're going to do is continual basic industry building up the industrial base, heavy industry, and we're also going to increase and improve consumer production. Now, how are we ever going to be able to do both of those things, you see? Um, very simply, we got the answer, we'll borrow from the West. Well, once they started borrowing, with borrowing from the West came IMF penetration and an enormous debt. With debt came IMF demands for restructuring. Restructuring is a euphemism for a harsh austerity program. You cut back in public sector spending. You cut wages. You cut, un you cut employment. Uh, you abolish worker management enterprises. In other words, you force your people to work harder for less, producing more, consuming less, and with that difference, you pay off your debt schedule or at least the interest that's accumulating on this wealth. Still, much of the economy was public sector and not for profit, including the very rich reserves of minerals and, and other natural resources in uh, the province of Kosovo and elsewhere. Then came another blow. What I'm saying to you is that there was a conscious and deliberate plan to fragment and break up Yugoslavia. The other blow was in November of 1990 when President George Bush went to the U.S. Congress and pressured them to pass the foreign appropriations law that called for the cutting off of all aid and credits to Yugoslavia. Trading without credits can be a disaster, especially for a country that doesn't have a hard currency. And this, this had a devastating effect on the country. <clears throat> the law also demanded that if any republic in Yugoslavia wanted further U.S. aid, it would have to break away from Yugoslavia and declare its independence. Okay, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's not my speculation. It's not my analysis. It's a public law. It's a public law. November 1990, the 1991 Foreign Appropriations Act. It's written right there. Go look at it. It required the U.S. State Department approval of election procedures and results in every one of the republics. It required that the republics do not hold national elections, but hold elections only in their own republics. And that the aid would go to individually to those republics. And when the aid did go, it went to those groups which the U.S. defined as democratic groups, which meant small right-wing ultra-nationalists and even fascistic parties. The ultimate goal was to break up Yugoslavia into a weak and helpless cluster of right-wing banana republics, privatized, deindustrialized. 
The U.S. decided to destroy, what the other Western powers decided to destroy Yugoslavia in 1989, <clears throat> when it became evident that it was the one country in Eastern Europe that would not voluntarily overthrow what remained of its socialist system. It was the one country that was still trying for some kind of economic independence outside of the world global free market third worldization process. They wanted a Yugoslavia whose rich natural resources would be at the disposal of multinational corporations, whose populations would work at subsistence wages, whose economy offered no competition with existing capitalist producers, only new investment opportunities. They wanted a Yugoslavia whose petroleum, engineering, mining, and automotive industries would be undone and deindustrialized. And they wanted to abolish Yugoslavia's public sector services and social programs. Now, why would U.S. policymakers, you really think U.S. policymakers are motivated by some need to abolish the social programs, the public sector services, and Yugoslavia? Why would they want to do that? Do you think they are such uh, nefarious, evil, intended individuals? They would want to abolish their social programs. Come on, Parenti. Are you being paranoid? Well, why would they want to abolish our social programs? <laughs> As they have been doing? Aid to families with dependent children, privatizing social security, that's what that president in, the, in Washington is doing. At least a third of it, he's gonna chunk it off and privatize it. Right under your noses while saying he's saving and serving Social Security, public health services, public education, environmental regulation, as inadequate at all, as all of these things have been, being cut back, cut back, cut back, library services, oh, we used to have that service, sorry, we don't have enough funds anymore. Not enough funds because we've got to build those missiles, you see. It's the third worldization of Yugoslavia, and it's the third worldization of the USA, and it's the third worldizations of everywhere. That's what the people in column A want. They want a nation that's run by about 50 multi-billionaires, and the rest of us will be 260 million peasants working from hand to mouth for them. Another goal behind the dismemberment of Yugoslavia is to achieve ideological monopoly. Last year, in Serbian Bosnia, the last remaining radio station was a Serbian station. It was a dissident station. It was critical of NATO, critical of Western policy. It was the last station in all of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And the article in the New York Times to see the reporter committing these mental gymnastics to explain why the NATO peacekeepers, i.e. Gestapo troops, went in and closed the station down, why that was a step toward more pluralistic democracy. That this was a, it was a marvelous thing to watch him do these gyrations, you know, down this column. Yugoslavia, before the NATO bombings, before this war began, before that, in Yugoslavia, every opposition newspaper, uh, every opposition political party had its own newspaper, its own radio station, and there were over 20 of them. Milosevic today, <clears throat> Milosevic today uh, uh, has more opposition parties in his parliament than any other leader in Europe. Of course, since the NATO bombings, they've shut down all the newspapers, they've shut down their radio stations, as we had happened in this country with German stations and, and things like that in World War I, if you remember, and we weren't even being bombed or attacked. Milosevic has been elected president three times, twice of the Republic of Serbia, once of the, of the Yugoslav Republic, or what's left of it now, in elections which foreign observers said were pretty much okay and legitimate. Yet he has been called a dictator. He is called, he is called a war criminal. The Hague War Crimes Tribunal has asked the United States for documentation of the war crimes that he has committed so that they, might in, they may indict him as a war criminal. So far, it's been over a year. No documentation has been forthcoming. Will you please tell me, Noam Chomsky called him the monstrous Milosevic, giving no specifics. Could someone start giving me some specifics about it? The, Yugoslav, the U Yugoslavia has another problem on this ideological monopoly. 
Its TV station is state-owned and is run by people who do not see the world the way the U.S. State Department and the U.S. National Security State does. The Yugoslav TV journalist Novenka Jovicic uh, told me, if I pronounce her last name right, I remember, she, asked, she told me when I met her in, in Greece, this was in, at a conference, um, she told me that she asked the U.S. ambassador, what do you want from us? This was last year before the bombings. And he said, we want your television system. Give us that. The U.S. imperialists want an ideological monopoly of all the world's media. And they've got something close to that already. In 1992, another blow was delivered against what remained of Yugoslavia. International sanctions led by the U.S. A freeze was imposed on all trade with Yugoslavia. The results brought utter economic disaster, hyperinflation, mass unemployment up to 70 percent, malnourishment, the collapse of the health care system at great cost to the population. By the way, sanctions, as the sanctions in Iraq demonstrate so horribly, civilian, the civilian population is not, does not suffer collateral damage or incidental spin-off from sanctions. The civilian population is the primary target of sanctions. That who's, that's who's being targeted. To justify this violent intervention to the U.S. public, there's been an unrelenting demonization of the Serbian people for the better part of a decade. Don't take my word for it. Listen to Charles Boyd, former, listen to his credentials, former deputy commander of the U.S. European Command. Listen to where he wrote in Foreign Affairs, the establishment journal, the establishment foreign policy journal in the U.S. In Foreign Affairs, September, October, 94, Boyd says, the popular image of this war in Bosnia is one of unrelenting Serbian expansion. In fact, what the Croatians call the occupied territories is land which the Serbs have held for more than three centuries. Most of the same is true of Serb land in Bosnia. In, in short, the Serbs are trying to hold on to their own. The U.S. has punished one side in this war and unfairly, Boyd says. It has supported the legitimacy of a leadership in the Bosnian Muslim government that has become increasingly ethnocentric in its makeup, single party in its rule, and manipulative in its diplomacy. We say we want peace, but we have encouraged a deepening of the war. Why were the Serbs targeted for demonization? By the way, at first they weren't. The U.S. was sort of backing the Serbs, and they got a guy, they pulled a guy up who they decided would be their man in the breaking up of Yugoslavia. He was a, a, he was a banker, and he was a Serbian nationalist, and his commitment to communism was very, very fuzzy or vague. And he was the ideal guy, they thought, and they called him a charismatic personality. His name was Milosevic. And he was our guy. But when they discovered that instead of being a tool, he would be an obstacle, then, of course, he became demonized. The Serbs are the largest nationality, and they're the one most opposed to the breakup of the Federation. But what about all the atrocities they've committed? Well, atrocities and executions have been committed on all three sides. You know, it really was fascinating. Someone got to do a media analysis of this. In 95, when Clinton was thinking of going in to Bosnia, the atrocity stories about the Serbs started piping up. I'll talk about some of them later in a minute. When he decided, as the 96 election started getting closer, when he decided it might be too messy and, and might, we shouldn't go in, the atrocity stories slowed down, and then the media started. There was a frame of about, maybe about a month or a couple of months there, a frame where they started saying, the Serbs are not the only ones committing atrocities, and they started quoting Croatian and Muslim atrocities and this sort of thing. It was amazing. Then when he decided after 96 that he was going to go in again, then the Serb atrocity stories came up again. It's, it's sort of like the gas flame on your stove, the way the media will follow policy. And there's no, there's no hidden mystery about it. There's no conspiracy about it. They wait to what's fed out to them. If the Pentagon or the, uh, or, the, or the U.S. or the White House says, this is terrible, this is terrible. We've got to go do this. They've got to go do this. U.S. are concerned. We've got to go do that. They are the stenographers of power, you see. <laughs> They're not the watchdogs of democracy.
They're the lapdogs of the national security state. Show me a war where there are no atrocities. You saw that movie, even, you see that movie, remember that movie Saving Private Ryan, which I thought could have been called Saving Private Ridiculous after the first 15 minutes, which was brilliant, but after that. But, but it shows right there in the Normandy beach, it shows American troops killing, executing German prisoners who had surrendered, who had dropped their arms and come up. They just shot them, shot them dead. There were forced executions on both, grudge, grudge killings. The airborne divisions in northern Europe, northwestern Europe, uh, and the German division would start killing each other's prisoners back and forth. Those are war crimes. There it was, right there on the big screen, by the way. Should we bomb Hollywood, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> Do you really trust U.S. leaders and the corporate-owned U.S. news media? I said to a friend of mine, the Serbian, the Serbian news source on the Internet said that cluster bombs are being used. He said, oh, you're trusting Serbian sources? I said, Which, what sources are you trusting? You're trusting Bill Clinton sources? Oh, well, Bill Clinton wouldn't lie to us, would he? Bill Clinton lied to us. It turns out they are using cluster bombs. It turns out they are using depleted uranium. Our own government now says it. You trust their stories? You remember the 500 premature babies that the Iraqis supposedly ripped from incubators in Kuwait, laughingly throwing the babies down on the hospital floors, vivid detailed descriptions, even names of some of the poor victims whose little premature baby was in there. It turned out the story was a total fabrication. 500 premature babies in incubators? It turns out in all of LA County there's not more than 50 incubators. Half of them are not being used at any one time. Did Kuwait specialize in premature births? <laughs> Instead of saying, we should have been saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, what is this story about? What's going on here? It was repeated again and again. I don't know any war where rapes are not committed, which is not to dismiss such awful things as rapes. Two rapes is two rapes too many. But the San Francisco Chronicle had a headline that said, rape, just, just, just two weeks ago, rape is an official Serb policy, Kosovo refugees say. Oh, they know about official policy. And you read down two columns, and finally you get the OSCE official says there have been there have been only, the rapes have only numbered in the dozens, very few dozens as a matter of fact, very few dozens of rapes. That's not an official policy. Oh, if Bill Clinton is looking to stop very few dozens of rapes, well that's, that's a slow two months in Washington DC. He could start much closer to home. He could concentrate on Capitol Hill as a matter of fact, or even closer. It's so touching to see our leaders finally, finally concerned about rape. It is so, so touching. But it's so odd that they've got to look so far away to go fight this crime. Go forth and rape, a Bosnian Serb commander was quoted throughout our media as saying an official policy. And the Bosnian Serb army, which numbers only about 30,000 men, numbered then, was accused of having raped from 25 to 100,000 Muslim women. There's an army that's involved in, 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 in bitter, desperate military force. Again, we should have said, wait a minute, what's going on here? What are these stories about? The Serb commander's name was never found. They never produced who was the Serbian commander. They never were able to trace that. They traced it back to Ruta Finn, right? That special PR group that was so happy and boasts about how it has convinced much of the progressive community in America that there's genocide and ethnic cleansing and mass rape and all of this is going on. And when they were questioned about the unverifiable, unconfirmed nature of the reports, they said, our goal is public relations. We're not here to get confirmation. And we achieved our goal. There was the infamous Sarajevo market massacre. The Serbs were blamed for that, and that became the turning point. That's when NATO forces went in and attacked, and that's when you had the worst, the worst single act, and, and let's say, to recently, of mass forced expulsion, and that was 
uh, 600,000 Serbs between 1991 and 95, but especially in 95 from Krajina, 200,000 of them. The, the, Bosnian Serb the Croatian Serb defenses were broken by NATO bombs and all that, and the Croatian army came through. 200,000 Serbs, those who could get away alive, uh, le left the country. It turns out that that massacre in Sarajevo market, as the story was leaked out on French television, that the UN knew all along that it was Muslim extremists who had bombed the people in that marketplace, that the explosion did not come from an artillery shell, but from a planted bomb. David Owen, who worked as an international negotiator with Cyrus Vance, in his book, Balkan Odyssey, page 262, himself admits that the NATO powers knew all along it was a Muslim bomb and the Serbs did not commit that act. Kosovo, when the KLA took over the casualties of a year fighting which had been 800, both sides, counting both sides, including Serbian police, including Albanians who didn't want to go along with the KLA, and the KLA sources took it over, it jumped suddenly to 2,000. When we called the San Francisco Chronicle bureau chief, we said, how did it jump from 800 to 2,000 in one day? He said, we don't know. Some of our eyebrows went up too now. Okay, but it's 2,000. Let's take that number. 2,000 casualties in over a year of fighting. That's not genocide. That's a civil war, a limited one. And now, of course, we have a massive reaction. But by the way, the fighting on the ground with KLA and the Serbs has been going on all through this bombing. And that's what the Serbs have been doing. They've been fighting in Kosovo against the KLA. And they have also been forcibly expelling now areas and villages and people, getting them out. No doubt with atrocities being committed, especially among the paramilitaries. Still, when you look at the pictures, you see Kosovo, Albanian, Albanian refugees coming out. A Republican congressman who was just there um, uh, last week, quoted in USA Today, said they all look so well fed. They have Nike shoes, I don't, and Nike clothes and stuff. How does that happen? They came out in their tractors, in their trucks, and in their cars. These people should not have been driven from their, uh, their uh, villages. Let me point out something about the ethnic cleansing. In 1945, the non-Albanian population of Kosovo was about 50%. Between 1945 and 1998, Albanians were coming across the border in substantial numbers. Serbs were being driven off their lands and off their farms. There were repeated requests by Serbians to Tito, who himself was a Croatian, and these went unheeded. The shift came by 1998, 1999, the population, the Albanian population in Kosovo was about 75%, although the media keeps reporting 90%. The other 25% was made up of about a quarter of a million Serbs, about 100,000 Romani, or we call gypsies, and the others being Turks, Macedonians, Montenegrins, and, and a variety of other peoples. We also see how the leader of the country is demonized when he is targeted by U.S. policy. Gaddafi of Libya, whose actual, whose actual sin was to nationalize the oil industry in Libya and begin to take the earnings from it and spend it on the people in column B, on things like reforestation and health and education and clinics, rather than giving it all to the people in column A. Gaddafi, a Hitlerite megalomaniac, a pathological liar, Libya is now the object of sanctions. Noriega of Panama, a swamp rat, one of the world's worst drug thieves and scums. That was Peter Jennings on a a ABC said that one. I'm quoting Dan Rathers, Peter Jennings, Tom Brokow here, a Hitlerite admirer. Saddam Hussein, the butcher of Baghdad, a madman, a beast, worse than Hitler. Do you remember George Bush? George Bush was saying that about him. Saddam Hussein is worse than Hitler. In a dynamic, fiery way, he has. You go, Georgie, do it to me. Oh, wow, you just set me on fire, Georgie. You just. There was a very, there was a very cruel feminist who said once that George Bush reminds every woman of her first husband. And, <laughs> I guess that means, you know, the one you sort of should marry, who has all the proper credentials, and he's kind of, uh, instead of the one 
with the improper credentials that you really want to be with, maybe. But, but you know, I thought, I thought it was very funny. George Bush reminds every woman of the first husband. Then I started thinking about it, you know. So I called up my ex-wife. <laughs> I said, do, uh, do I remind you of George Bush in any way? She said, what are you talking about? So I felt much better, you know. <laughs> Well, you know, we all, we all have our moments of insecurity, you know. <clears throat> now we have Milosevic, described as a new Hitler by Bill Clinton. Called him a new Hitler. Bill Clinton learns his lessons well. Listen to the New York Times. The New York Times did a, a little, there's a couple of paragraphs of psychobiography they had on Milosevic. And I want to read it. The people who write for the New York Times are very brilliant. Ooh, ooh, they're so brilliant, the New York Times people. They must be because they think so themselves, you know. And so it must be true. So I want to read the brilliant, this brilliant passage from the New York Times. And they're from New York, don't forget. Hey. I'm from New York, but I'm really not brilliant. If I were, I'd be writing for the New York Times. <laughs> Milosevic. As a youth, Mr. Milosevic was a pudgy loner. Mm. <laughs> See, now being a loner in the American political lexicon, this is obvious evidence of psychopathology. And <laughs> you're an assassin, obviously, you know. Lee Harvey Oswald was a loner. He may have been a loner, he was no assassin. Uh, Timothy McVeigh, the kid who shot Ronald Reagan, what was his name? Hinkley, Hinkle, I forget. A loner. They all call, all call a loner. Oh, they were loners. They all have friends and family, but they call a loner. It's a loner, that's for sure. Oh. But Milosevic, you know, was a very specially serious case because he was a pudgy loner. <laughs> See, now, 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 pudginess is un-American. <laughs> I mean, I don't think so. I, I kind of, I think pudginess isn't bad at all, but pudginess is un-American. Now, if Milosevic, though, if he was a lean loner, that'd be, that'd be even, that would be bad, too. So, it's best not to be either pudgy or lean. Uh, let me take it all, let me take, give you the read this whole quote to you, take it from the top again. As a youth, Mr. Milosevic was a pudgy loner. That's two strikes, pudgy loner. Who shunned sports, strike three. <laughs> and wrote poetry, strike four. <laughs> Does anyone need any further proof that here was a psychotic killer nerd. <laughs> the Times goes on. Today, Milosevic is often described in Serbian profiles as reclusive and moody. His, his country's being bombed into the ground. He's moody. <laughs> With few friends. Yeah, a lot of them are dead. Uh, Though in public appearances and interviews, he can be as effusive and happy as a door-to-door -door salesman. Fascinating, isn't it fascinating? So we have an effusive, reclusive salesman type. Even the managing editor of Foreign Affairs, the most establishment of journals we have, the managing editor notes, quote, Milosevic, who rules an impoverished country that has not attacked its neighbors, is no Adolf Hitler. He is not even Saddam Hussein. And it's pretty bad when foreign affairs start sounding good, you know? That, it really makes you realize where your own meat, where our media, our, our media, they're not our media, where their media really are at. Well, some people argue, look, it's not a, cl a case of class or international interventionist issues. It's nationalism, these ancient ethnic enmities. That's what it really is all about. Well, that presumes that class and ethnicity are mutually exclusive uh, and competitive forces. It's got to be either one or the other. Not at all. Ethnic enmity can be enlisted to serve class interests. The CIA tried to do that with the Hmong people in Vietnam to divide with the Mosquito Indians in Nicaragua, 
and elsewhere. The CIA did that in Bosnia. Don't take my word for it that the CIA was in Bosnia. Check the headlines. Manchester London Guardian, November 1794. CIA agents training Bosnian army. The, uh, the London Observer, November 20. America's secret Bosnia agenda. The European, November 25. How the CIA helps Bosnia fight back. Generally, ladies and gentlemen, when different national groups are living in a society where there's some measure of hope, security, and prosperity, they tend to get along. There may be ruffles and differences and, and turf scuffles and the like, but there's a lot of intermingling. Uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's, a lot, there's even a lot of intermarriage, as was going on in Yugoslavia. And um, even in Croatia, in Croatia where you could say the northwest part was overwhelmingly Croatian, the southeast part was, was Serbian. Even there, there, was, there, was, there, were, there were lots of Croatians living in the south, lots of Serbians in the north. Bosnia-Herzegovina Bosnia -Herzegovina was totally intermingled. That old that idea of partitioning Bosnia into these three parts was a totally artificial thing imposed. If you look, Michel Cologne has a, has a map of the ethnic distributions in Bosnia. Totally, I mean, it, they forcibly extract people block by block, they were so intermingled. When things are going okay, when things start going bad, when you've got, when you've got sanctions, when you've got the loss of trade credits, when you've got 70% unemployment, when things are beginning to unravel and, and get desperate, that's when people begin to want to jump ship. And when you've got a U.S. national security state backing the most divisive, militant, fascistic national elements, with fascist organizations arising in Yugoslavia that hadn't been seen in 45 years, armed with guns and money and organization and hired thugs and operating with a blatant assurance that they had the whole might of the U.S. to their backs. That's when the divisions come and you've got a U.S. government that is actually positing, pushing for civil war. And that economic decline and all that activated it. And what was the outcome? The outcome is that in Croatia, you now have the Republic of Croatia with President Tuzman, a Nazi sympathizer, who wrote a book saying the Holocaust wasn't all that bad and most of it never really happened. Tuzman, whose flag is the Czech Ustasi flag, which was the Nazi collaborators in World War II, whose army salutes with a straight arm Nazi salute today, Tushman, who suppressed the more liberal Croatian groups that wanted conciliatory policies with the Serbs. Tushman, who presided over the forced evacuation of 600,000 Serbs from Croatia between 91 and 95. I don't see the media or the White House giving much indignant play to that one. Tushman, who lives in obscene wealth along with his cronies while the people of Croatia now wallow in economic misery. In Croatia, it's five years in prison if you criticize the president. But I don't hear Clinton talking about the need to bomb Croatia back into democracy. Then there's Bosnia, where the U.S. has supported the Muslim fundamentalist Izetbegovic. Izetbegovic, who was with the Waffen SA when he was younger in World War II. A Nazi, not a collaborator, not a sympathizer, but an active Nazi. And who today now is the president of Ma Bosnia and hailed as a, as a democratic leader who wants to establish a religious Islamic republic in Bosnia, who suppressed more liberal Muslim leaders. Bosnia is now under IMF and NATO regency. It's not permitted to mobilize and develop its own internal resources. It's not allowed to extend credit or self-finance through an independent monetary system. Its, its state-owned assets, including energy, water, telecommunications, media, and transportation, are all being sold off to private corporate investors at garage sale prices. And the Serbian part of Bosnia was just last year democratically elected a president who was against the free market reforms, was removed forcibly by NATO troops because he was thought to be against, uh, because he was thought to be a hardliner, is the code word used there. NATO is in violation of its own charter, which says that it can take military action only against aggression that's been committed against one of, its, one of its members. Yugoslavia has attacked no NATO member. <clears throat> what, gives the, what gives these U.S. leaders the right to intervene 
but gives them the right. I hear, I hear my fellow Americans, I hear my, some of my progressive friends sounding like little Colonel Blimps, little imperialists. Well, we've got to do something. We, oh, we got to do something? Really? And the African nations, what if four or five African nations formed an alliance and decided that they didn't like 300 years of slavery for their people and lynch mob, uh, Jim Crow segregation, another 100 years of that and, and police brutality now? What if they decided to invade the U.S.? What if they had the power and the technology to do that and say, we don't like the way you've been treating the African minority in the U.S.? Well. We wouldn't think that that would be the normal course and they'd had an innate right. But there's this arrogance of power here that we, we, says the little fly on the chariot wheel, we are kicking up such a great dust. We, you're getting puffed up. That's what, that's got to stop this talking we. It's they that are doing it. We are against it. U.S. leaders have actually abandoned any kind of traditional diplomacy. You know, traditional diplomacy is a process of give and take. In traditional diplomacy, you have a proposal, a counter-proposal. Uh, you may pull back your ambassador to show your negotiators, to show you displeased that it's not working. You come back, you bluster, you bluff, you uh, harangue, you make a new set of proposals, you bring in more mediation, you reach maybe even for your sword, but you never pull it from the scabbard. You come away finally with a solution which might leave both sides satisfied, one side perhaps more dissatisfied than the other, but never to the point of being forced to war. That's what traditional diplomacy was about. It was this way of trying to stop conflicts short of war. U.S. diplomacy is something else. U.S. diplomacy makes traditional diplomacy really look good. The goal, as it was done in Vietnam, as it was done against Nicaragua, as it was done against Iraq, as it's done against Yugoslavia, the method is to issue a set of demands. The demands are treated as non-negotiable. This is what you're going to have to do. Although to the American people and in the media, they're called accords. They're called agreements, as the Rambouillet agreements. Those weren't agreements, those were ultimatums. And by the way, Milosevic accepted every one of the Rambouillet agreements except one. The one which said that foreign troops could come in and occupy all of Kosovo and then there was a hidden subsection which not many people knew about which, which said and they would have the right to move into any part of Yugoslavia anywhere else at any time at their own discretion. It was a total surrender to a foreign occupation and this was the unacceptable thing. The other side's resistance or even hesitancy in accepting these U.S offers and proposals and agreements and accords. The other side's hesitancy is treated as an unwillingness to negotiate in good faith. It's announced that U.S. leaders are running out of patience. It's announced that the other side is stonewalling and snubbing these offers that we're making. And so U.S. leaders finally have no other recourse, have a, having shown almost a, 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 a Christ-like patience, they now, they now have to have nothing left that they can do but bomb this other country and start killing large numbers of its men, women, and children. And, and as, as Bill Clinton says, you can blame all those deaths on Milosevic. That's right, he's, 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 the, he's the cause of it all. If he did exactly what we said when he was supposed to, this wouldn't have happened. And the side that resists and is hesitant is labeled as war criminals. Let me read to you I'm winding it down, but let me just, two more things I want to say, a few more things. Let me just read to you a statement that I got on the internet from a woman who is a member of the Greens party in Belgrade. This is what she writes about the bombing. Now this is already a month old. It's gotten much worse. Serbia is one of the greatest sources of underground waters in Europe and the contamination from U.S. explosives and depleted uranium will be felt in the whole surrounding area all the way to the Black Sea. NATO is bombing factories. The workers in the greater part of our great industrial complexes have decided to make a living wall around their working places. They're doing this not only to defend their country, but because they have become so impoverished by the years of sanctions that the destruction of factories would mean condemnation 
to a poverty equal to death. In other words, the, these workers are trying to defend the only thing they have left, which is their social capital, the factories. NATO chooses extremely dangerous targets. To, and, and then she goes on about nuclear reactors, uh, nuclear waste storage places that have been, uh, that have been getting close to being hit, um, petrochemical factories where the fumes are escaping, artificial fertilizers. The municipality of Barich has also been hit with the great complex for the production of chloride, which is using Bhopal technology. You remember what happened in Bhopal, 4,000 people died horrible deaths, respiration in Bhopal, India. Um, <clears throat> from that industrial accident. It's not necessary for me to explain what the blowing up of one of such factories represents. Not only Belgrade, which is situated 10 kilometers distance, would, could, would be endangered, but the rest of Europe too. On the second day in the Belgrade suburbs, a factory for the chemical production and a rocket fuel storage was hit, causing uh, intoxication of the entire surrounding area. Four national parks were hit all members of the International Association of the National Reservations. You have to realize that Yugoslavia is among 13 of the world's richest biodiversity countries. And then she goes on to talk about the different cultural places. It has one of the richest film archives in the world that's been destroyed. Uh, medieval Orthodox churches, monasteries, which are centuries old, and uh, candidates for UNESCO heritage lists have been hit, and so forth and so on. And then she goes on to describe the terrible effect on children, uh, elderly people, and all. Besides the actual killings, a lot of people are dying because there's simply, uh, uh, there's a, you know, the normal patterns of life and life support systems are being destroyed. When you hit, you might see it in the paper, NATO is boasting that they're hitting the electricity systems in Yugoslavia. When you hit electricity, you are committing an act of chemical warfare because the electricity systems are the only way you get water in any, any modern developed society. You need electricity to get water to you. If you don't have water, people need water to live. They need it to drink, they need it for cooking, they need it for cleaning themselves, they need it for waste disposal. With the warm weather coming up, and you wouldn't believe it here in Seattle, but with the warm weather coming up, um, there will be typhoid and typhus and, and this kind of stuff will break out. That's what's happening in Iraq. That's why people were dying there. You see, there's two kinds of bombings that's going on. There's a saturation bombing or carpet bombing. World War II, we used to call it saturation bombing. <clears throat> carpet bombing was just killing people, but there is surgical strikes also. They are targeting these things. They're targeting, they've learned in Iraq, they learned it very well, that you can destroy the life support systems of the society. And when you do that, you make war, total war, upon the, the, the population. And that is what is happening. She goes on to say, I am deeply convinced that I am speaking in the name of all the citizens of Yugoslavia when I say that we have the capabilities and the political will to find a solution for the Kosovo problem. If we are allowed to seek the solution together with the Albanians, and if we take into consideration the fact that all of us have the right to participate in this solution, all one-sidedness and media manipulation are part of the mechanism bringing suffering, destruction, and death. By the way, there's 100,000 Albanians living in Belgrade. In Belgrade themselves. They have their own stores in Albania and all that sort of thing. And they're getting hit too. <clears throat> I want to read one other thing. This was written by Tom Watson. Anybody know who Tom Watson was? A hundred years ago he wrote this, in 1898. Tom Watson was an American populist. He was governor of Georgia and a U.S. senator elected on the populist ticket to fight the Democratic and Republican monopoly of that day. And what was happening was William McKinley was very craftily drawing the American people into the Spanish-American War. McKinley said, we've got to go in, and the newspapers all said, we've got to go in to rescue the Cubans against whom the Spaniards are, are, are committing some of the worst horrible atrocities that you can imagine. And by the way, the Spaniards were no angels in Cuba. But most of those atrocity stories were coming out of the febrile, fertile imaginations of Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst and put into the penny press, and also coming out of U.S. Congress, too. And by the way, that's the same thing I'm saying here about Yugoslavia. To say that these atrocities are contrivances for the most part in propaganda is not to say that Milosevic and the Serbs are blameless and that they're angels. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that we have to even be fans of any one side. 
But regardless of what you think of those people, certainly you can see that this bombing is a horrible thing. Now Watson understood that this war was not in the interests of the American people. And he wrote this way. Who gets the benefit of the war, the Spanish-American war he's talking about? The bond seekers, the capitalists, the railroads. National bankers will profit by this war. The new bonds give them the basis for new banks and their power is prolonged. Munition makers will profit by this war. The privileged classes all profit by this war. It takes the attention of the people off economic issues and perpetuates the unjust system they have put upon us. Politicians profit by the war. It buries issues they dare not meet. What do the people get out of this war? The fighting and the taxes. What is the United States doing in this war with Spain in the first place? True, Spain is oppressing Cuba, but so is England oppressing Ireland, Egypt, and India. France is oppressing Siam and Madagascar. Turkey is oppressing Armenia. Should we then take up arms against the oppressors of the world? We would more likely end up by becoming oppressors ourselves. The Spaniards and Cubans were bushwhacking one another and killing from three to five men at a battle. We have gone down there and killed more people in three months than they would have killed in 13 years. If they were starving before, who feeds them now? What are we going to get out of this war as a nation? Endless trouble, complications, expense? Republics cannot go into the conquering business and remain republics. Militarism leads to military domination, military despotism. Imperialism smooths the way for the emperor. And that's what you got. When you have a president, when you have a president who's in violation of the NATO charter, who's in violation of the UN charter, who's in violation of the War Powers Act, and who's in violation of the US Constitution, where the, the founders of the Constitution said, that you cannot leave this decision of war to only one man and if you leave it to the president you no longer have a president you no longer have a republic you have an emperor you have a king if he can commit a whole nation to war and killing just by his own personal judgment that's not a democracy and they said there's got to be a debate and there's got to be accountability <laughs> I remember, I remember during the Iraq war, uh, a student said to me, well, that's where you and I differ, you see, because I have faith in the president. He was talking about George Bush. He said, I, I said, excuse me, you have faith in the president? He said, I trust the president. I have faith in him. I said, what, I said, what does that mean, you have faith in the president? This isn't religion. I mean, you have faith in him the way my Italian grandma had faith in St. Anthony. Do you have a picture of George Bush on your bureau? You light little candles to him, do you? You trust? You trust your president? You mean the way trust meaning you give a certain, your destiny, a portion of your destiny to someone unquestioningly as you might to very close loved ones or close relatives? And even them check them out once in a while, right? <laughs> No, democracy isn't about faith, it isn't about trust, it's about distrust. It's about accountability, it's about challenge, it's about debate, it's about exposure. It's about people becoming the active agents of their own lives, wanting to know what's going on. I don't have to trust you, I don't want to trust you, I want to see what's going on. Whose interests do you really represent, my friends? <laughs> And we hear, we hear people say, including some of our progressive friends, our liberal friends, yes, I, oh, I know, the bombings don't work. Oh, I, I'm not supporting those bombings. The bombings are stupid, I know. But well, we've got to do something. Well, the bombings aren't stupid. They're profoundly immoral. The, the, Serbian, the Serbian army, which is expelling, ex expelling people, by the way, mo many of those people are fleeing the bombings. If you read those accounts closely, you find a lot of these people are saying, we're fleeing the bombings. 50,000 Serbs have fled from Kosovo in the last three months. Are the Serbs ethnically cleansing themselves? The bombings do work. 
The bombings are working. They know what they're doing. Just because you don't know what they're doing doesn't mean they don't know what they're doing. Of course they know what they're doing. The bombings are achieving what they're supposed to, which is to destroy Yugoslavia, to turn it into a deindustrialized, beggar-poor nation of cheap labor, completely defensive to the interests of capital investors. This is a batterer's policy. The batterer is not irrational. The batterer uses violence against his helpless spouse. He uses just a certain amount of level to get a certain response and batters that person down and batters the person down. And that's what this is. It's a battering policy to destroy and smash them down, but smash them and splinter them so badly that they will never rise again and never come back again, even, even as a viable bourgeois nation, let alone socialist. The old arguments we hear with regard to Vietnam are coming back. Well, we can't just pull out. Oh, yes, we can. We can. We can do it with two words. You can pull out with just two words, it called ceasefire, and then another two words, NATO disband. And yes, we, we, the real we, we, we really do have to do something. Call the White House, call your Congress people, your media, talk back, demonstrate, organize, agitate, educate yourself and others. Let them know how you feel. Don't think they're not interested, my friends. Oh man, are they interested in that. Oh man, do you think they are not watching you all the time? Why do you think guys like me are under surveillance? I mean, I'm not kidding you. When I pick up my, when I, the phone rings and I pick it up and someone starts talking to me, mimicking in a mocking tone a conversation I just had on the phone two hours ago with someone else, then, then you're moving from surveillance to harassment. But they let me know that I'm under surveillance. But it's not just, it's just not, not just people who are super active and all. They want to know what the general public is thinking. They never stop thinking about you. When you say, oh, they don't care what we're thinking. Oh, no, they always, always focus on you because they know they're standing on your shoulders. And if this great mass began to shrug and rumble and all that sort of thing, it gets very wobbly up there. So against the lies. against the lies and the homicidal violence of this national security aberration, the thin, frail voice of reason and democracy can become a mighty chorus and a strong resistance. I have seen it happen before, and we can make it happen again. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> humanity you can be divided into group A, B, and C. Group A is made up of those people who live principally off stock dividends, interest payments on their bond investments, royalties on their land and mineral holdings, rents on their properties. That's group A. Group B and C make up the other 99. 5% of humanity and they live off group B people in group B live off wages salaries fees commissions tips pensions and group C is made up of tens of millions of people who don't even get that they live in utter destitution from hand to mouth from whatever handouts or whatever charity bits or whatever fragmentary incomes they can scrounge um, the thing that the people in group A and B have in common is that they both live off the labor of the people in group B. The people in group A don't just do this, they're very active. They have an active element. We could call them the owning class because they own almost everything in the world. They own most of the land. They own the, the factories, the industries, the banks, the media. They also own a lot of the state, that is, their representatives, the politically active elements from their ranks, move in and become the secretaries of defense, secretaries of state, CIA directors, 
Um, and they're the ones who also filter out in the beginning uh, with, the, with the very first primary. The primary before the one you get to vote in is called the money primary. And they, with their contributions, they filter out who will be the suitable candidates and who will be the unknowns. Uh, and who will be designated at the very beginning the front runners. Now, they take great pains at trying to keep the world this way because they love it that way. I know in the movies you see things about the unhappy rich. Don't, don't believe it for a minute. <laughs> they, love, they love having their private planes in there and put a brake on the Iraqi revolution. And he was our boy. He was, the, he was the White House's boy for a long time. But then he started doing some funny things like free medical care, education. Iraq had one of the better standards of living in the entire Middle East. And then he started doing something that was totally unacceptable, trying to fight for a better deal on the oil prices against the uh, Seven Sister oil cartels. And that's when, of course, he had to be done in. The U.S. is also the most active promoter or protector of drug traffickers who serve the gangster functions of U.S. policy, which is terror, assassination, intimidation. Late 1940s, Corsica and Sicilian drug mafia, communist longshore unions, which were honest and militant and dedicated and political, were smashed by, the, by these gangsters and terrorists with the help and aid by the CIA. And the payback, the payback that the CIA gave to these gangsters was a free hand in the drug trades. In Southeast Asia, the drug lords, active collaboration, the Golden Triangle, Air America was the airline that shipped the, her the heroin out of there. Air America, it turned out, was owned by the CIA. And do you know what the first market was for the Golden Triangle? Where was it? Soldiers. That's right. The soldiers in Vietnam, a perfect market nearby, a hundred thousand young men with nothing to do, homesick, with Good money, as compared to other, most of the world, a spending money, nothing to do, and all of them, or so many of them, come back with a drug problem. That drug problem didn't just happen. The Vietnam GIs just didn't suddenly just go berserk. It's because that, that the drugs were there, they were cheap, they were plentiful, they were pouring in. Supply creates demand. We always think of demand creating supply, but in many instances, it's supply that creates demand. In Afghanistan, the Mujahideen who fought against the Soviets were drug dealers. I remember seeing it prominently displayed in the Washington Post on page 22 to 35th paragraph. With the Mujahideen back in power, um, uh, the heroin supplies, um, we have death squads trained, equipped, paid for. We have a Guarda Civil uh, mili and military trained, equipped for, uh, advised by your people. All you do is take care of me, my brother Jose, my family, a few other people, and the little five or six families that own most of the land, and we'll take care of everything else for you. There's no occupational safety to worry about. There's no minimum wage to worry about. There's no, there's no environmental protections to worry about. There's no labor collective bargaining protections to worry about. There's no consumer protections. There's no child labor laws. You just come on in here. It's the free market in the free world. And that's what we're all about. And you tell your people, too, at home, that you're defending democracy, that you're, having, you're, you're bringing elections to this country and the, and the like. But you don't talk about this part of it. The U.S. has also been active in covert actions or proxy mercenary wars against popular revolutionary governments in Cuba, Angola, Mozambique, Ethiopia, Portugal, South Yemen, Nicaragua, Cambodia, East Timor, Western Sahara, and elsewhere. They've been active in forcibly overthrowing reformist governments in Egypt, Lebanon, Peru, Iran, Syria, Zaire, Jamaica, the Fiji Islands, Afghanistan. Before the Soviets ever went into Afghanistan, the CIA was in there through the Pakistanis, ready to destabilize the country. Since World War II, U.S. direct military invasions. Now, not proxy wars, not subversion, not CIA destabilization and terror 
and death squads, but direct military invasion with U.S. forces since World War II, or aerial attacks by U.S. forces in Vietnam, Dominican Republic, North Korea, Laos, Cambodia, Lebanon, Libya, Grenada, Panama, Iraq, Somalia, and now Yugoslavia. When you ask, why, are, why is U.S. in Yugoslavia? Why not? They're everywhere else. It's an empire, my friends. It's an empire. And the empire extracts the resources of the republic in order to maintain its imperialist network. It's an empire with 300 major military bases and 2,000 minor bases. Their estates and all their wonderful things and their power and their prestige and their immense wealth. And most of all, they're very concerned about those instruments of organization which accumulate that wealth for them, which are called the giant multinational corporations. Corporations are called producer interests. In fact, they don't produce anything. You tell me what a corporation produces. You tell me what a CEO has ever produced. They are, in fact, organizations for the extraction of surplus value from the workforce. They're organizations that uh, uh, to mobilize economic and political power to make the world safe for Group A. They don't do that. They don't do that directly in many cases. But they pick the people. They pay the lobbyists. They pay the campaign fees. They do all that stuff. And the state then comes in. That component of the state, not the entire government, but that special component of the state known as the national security state, which is made up of the White House, the Defense Department, the State Department, the CIA, military intelligence, the Joint Chief of Staffs, FBI, and a few other elements here or there. That national security state, its function is to make the world safe for the Fortune 500 and for the people in Group A. And the history, and this is why the history of U.S. foreign policy, especially after World War II, is a history of bloody, repressive interventions on behalf of the people of Group A. U.S. leaders profess a dedication to democracy, yet over the last 50 years, U.S. national security state, the U.S. National Security State has been a key force in overthrowing reformist democratic governments in Guatemala, Guyana, Dominican Republic, Brazil, Chile under Allende, Iran under Mossadegh, Uruguay, Syria, Indonesia under Sukarno, Greece, twice in Greece, Argentina, twice, Haiti, Bolivia, and other countries. These lists, I'm going to give you some lists, they are far from complete. And they replaced them with pro-capitalist military regimes that opened up their markets, opened up their resources, opened up the labor markets to them, and said, come on in, boys. Here it is. It's all yours. And if our workers get out of line, if they start organizing and all, we can beat them down. This is all over the world. That's a matter of public record. I'm not just arguing that point. It's a matter of public record. Not that it's much taught and rarely ever mentioned in the mainstream media. Now, why has a professedly peace-loving democratic nation found it necessary to use so much violence and repression against so many peoples in so many places? An important goal, as I say, is to make the world safe for the Fortune 500. Governments that strive for any kind of economic independence Governments that support any kind of populist redistributive politics, which is extracting, say, as Allende did in Chile. In the three years he was in office, um, he took a portion of the gross national income, maybe about five or six or seven percent, shifted from the people in Group A, the people who lived off their investments, to the people who lived off their labor. And that was what was wrong with Allende. When you come in and you start taking and tampering with my wealth, I will kill you. And that's what they did to, to Allende. Such governments are the ones most likely to feel the wrath of U.S. intervention or invasion. The designated enemy can be a reformist, populist military government, as in Panama under Torillo, and even under Noriega, Egypt under President Nasser, Peru under Velasco, Velasco, Portugal after Salazar when the generals came in, 
It could be a Christian socialist government as in Nicaragua under the Sandinistas. It could be a social democracy popular front as in Chile under Allende or in Jamaica under Michael Manley or in Greece under Papandreou in 1965 or the Dominican Republic under Juan Bosch. Or it could be a Marxist-Leninist government as in Cuba, Vietnam, North Korea. It could be an Islamic revolutionary order as in Libya under Gaddafi, or even a conservative militarist regime as in Iraq under Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein was CIA. He was put in by the CIA and his job was to